Hi, I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. Today's a big day for us because right here in our office live, we have one of my heroes, Dr. Steve Perlman. Not only a professor up at Boston University, that's not the important stuff. The important stuff is, is that this dentist has devoted his life his life to taking care of those of us whose brains are different, those of us with special needs. He's going to deny it because he's humble, but he's basically one of the founders of the Special Olympics, and he is indeed the founder of the AADMD, the American Academy of, he'll tell you what all the initials are for, it's dentists and doctors and things like that. And he's got a million other things. I, I could, you know, while the camera focuses on him, let me just read you some of his qualifications. I love doing this to our... I got three pages of this. I'm not going to bore you with them. Clinical Professor of Pediatric Dentistry at Boston University Goldman School of Dental Medicine. Founder of the AADMD. Uh, special Liaison, which is... A, we're going to find out how he really founded the Special Olympics, which I was lucky enough because of Steve and Rick Rader to give a keynote with Tim Shriver uh, back in 2015 at the ceremonies in LA at the Special Olympics. Um, he talks the talk, but he walks the walk. His practice, he's taking care of these, all of these people who are, frankly, it's real difficult, hard work. And he's no spring chicken, and his wife Harriet says he ought to retire, but he's not retiring. And I'm going to shut up now and say, Steve, Steve Perlman, welcome. Thank you, Aggie. It's great to be here and great to see you. All right. Now, tell us, let's go back in time. You're a young man. You're a dentist. Tell us how the Special Olympics were born. What really happened? Okay, well, you know, the Special Olympics was really founded by Eunice Kennedy Shriver. And uh, back, it's the 50th anniversary next year. What I did was bring in health into Special Olympics. So um, I, um, I became a pediatric. One of the reasons why I went into pediatric dentistry as a specialty was because we were the ones that took care of people with disabilities in the dental world, in the health world. And there was no transitioning for patients from, with special needs from pediatrics to adults. Um, so we took care of the whole gamut. So basically, I, early on in my career, I got involved in the national level in treating dental care and, and overall medical health care um, to improve the quality of life and the health for people with intellectual disabilities. And I had some national roles. And then my life really changed uh, back in like 1963 when I got a call from Eunice Kennedy Shriver that her sister, Rosemary Kennedy, was having all these dental problems and they needed somebody to take care of her. Rosemary was in her early 60s when I got this call from, Rose, from Eunice Kennedy Shriver, who founded Special Olympics and created Special Olympics and who really ran the Kennedy Foundation for the family. And what had happened was Rosemary had been hidden from the public for many, many years in St. Coletta's, which was a Catholic-run school in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. And Rosemary was supposedly getting the best health care that anybody could afford. If she had an orthopedic problem, they would send her to St. Louis. If it was a, a, a kidney problem, it would be somewhere else. And so for her dental, prob dental work and the people that followed her, she was treated not by one dentist, but by a team at a residency hospital program. And although these people have been following and taking care of Rosemary for years, they decided that it was best to treat her by edentulating her, which means taking out all of her remaining teeth. To do this, they needed the permission of the legal guardian, who was Senator Ted Kennedy and Eunice Kennedy Shriver. And when Eunice Shriver heard that they were going to take out all of her sister's teeth, she was so horrified by this that she, number one, refused permission for them to do it. 
and then put a search on for somebody to treat her and wound up calling me. Interesting that a pediatric specialist 2,000 miles away would be called upon to treat an adult with an intellectual disability. But that was the landscape then, you know, and it still is, that pediatric people are asked to treat adults with disabilities. So anyway, uh, to, to make a long story short, the family uh, flew her to Massachusetts for me to do an oral rehabilitation under general anesthesia. And as typical with patients with intellectual disabilities, there were other problems that needed to be addressed. So as a clinical, prof as a clinical person, my first call was to Rosemary's personal physician in Wisconsin and said that uh, I was gonna do an oral rehabilitation under general anesthesia. Was there any other health issues that needed to be addressed? And her primary care physician said, well, thank you so much, and then gave me a list of medical procedures that we should do to help him continue for better medical care for Rosemary. So wow. during the dental admission, um, we did other extensive medical treatments for her, tests that they were not able to do unless she was given the general anesthesia. But that's, that's typical of the disjoining of healthcare, Hacky, as you know, for people with intellectual disabilities that present with behavioral issues that don't lend themselves to normal treatment in the office. Now we fast forward yeah. to 2015. I'm out there at your AADMD event as part of the Special Olympics in LA. I'm giving a keynote. Tim Shrive is giving a keynote. Ann Costello of the great uh, Golasano Foundation. Foundation. Yep. The, uh, let's say the name of that foundation. Golasano. It's the G-O-L-I-S-A-N-O Go -L -L -Foundation. Yeah, foundation. Great foundation. They do great things. And we go on a tour led by Steve of the medical tents they set up at USC. And that was my epiphany there. Then it all made sense. We went on this tour, hundreds of medical tents set up. I was with kids from a hundred different nations. I was comparing my hearing aids to their kids who couldn't hear got their first hearing test and on the spot. Can you imagine the logistics of this? They got fitted with hearing aids right there before they went back to their underdeveloped country. I saw kids get their first eyeglasses. Every miracle, one after the other after the other. And I'm following around Steve Perlman, who's like a commanding general walking around there and everybody's coming up and hugging them and everything. And when we finally got back a few hours later, I said, I said to Tim Shriver, I said, I finally figured out what the Special Olympics really is. He says, what, Hacky? I said, it's a front. He goes, what do you mean? I said, it's a front for delivering excellent health care to 100 different countries. And then Steve goes over on clinics over there. They go all around the world. The AADMD and affiliated organizations are just a great meeting place, a great where it all comes together the way it's supposed to be, the way it's supposed to be, where in his world, society does embrace his society, which is a limited society of very special doctors and dentists where they embrace neurodiversity, they recognize the problem, they recognize it's a whole lifespan. It's not just cute kids, because the kids turn into adults and then you have all the transitions that go on. And what has been your biggest challenge along this whole journey? Well, let me, I'll take you through because it'll all fit together for you to see, to see how it works. So um, after the success, so I treated Rosemary they, uh, in Boston. They flew her to me, uh, and we did the oral rehabilitation under general anesthesia. And when I called Mrs. Shriver to tell her that her sister was fine, and incidentally, we didn't do one extraction. I restored every tooth that she had, 
And for the 13 wow. or 14 years that she lived after, she never had a, another dental problem at all. Wow. Yeah, so we, we didn't do any extractions at all. Which just shows, it just goes to show you, that, and this wasn't the decision of only one dentist that he, that he would indentulate her. This was a, a decision of an entire team at a general practice residency. But it just shows the lack of respect, the lack of dignity, the lack of care for people with intellectual disabilities. So anyway, when I called Mrs. Shriver to tell her that her sister was fine and the operation was success and we did the other medical procedures as well, uh, she said to me that I've got to meet you and thank you for taking care of my sister, but more important, to teach me about dental care for people with intellectual disabilities. So the way the Kennedy family works, in two weeks, I was sitting at an amazing meeting with Eunice Kennedy Shriver, her husband, Sergeant Shriver, who was one of my true heroes in American history. You know, the founder of the Peace Corps, the founder of, uh, of the, well, the, led the war on poverty, ambassador to France, vice presidential candidate, uh, every amazing civil job th that could be held. And the other person in that room was Dr. Robert Cook, who we credit with founding the field of developmental medicine. Robert Cook was the first developmental pediatrician in the country. He was the parent of two children with Crudichat syndrome, and he was the uh, chief of pediatrics at Johns Hopkins University at the time. Mrs. Shriver allowed me two hours to talk about dental care for people with intellectual disabilities, but I came to not talk about dental care for people with intellectual disabilities. I came to talk about medical care overall health care for people with intellectual disabilities and the great disparities that exist. And Mrs. Shriver said to me, uh, I don't understand this. What are, you what are you talking about? I said, of all the injustices and of all the problems of people with intellectual disabilities, health care is their number one problem. And she said, I don't believe that. She said, I've devoted my life to improving the quality of life for people with intellectual disabilities. And, I th and I'm the most famous person in the country on this whole I issue. She said, if I thought, I, I, I thought that in order for people with intellectual disabilities to succeed in this world, that number one, education was paramount, that they had to be educated to the highest level of education that they were able to do. Second, what are they going to do when they get older? Job opportunities. What are they going to be do, do to become pro productive citizens? And the third was housing. Safe housing is what I cared about because as in, in those years, we were closing down all of our institutions. You know, in President Kennedy's administration, he passed the famous legislation that everybody was allowed to live, everybody should live in the community to have the highest standard of living that they can have. So that led to the effective deinstitutionalization of people within, with disabilities in the United States. The problem was that this process was taking pl place without community support. So people were released from the institutions where they were safe into a community where there was no health care available to them. And we can get in, we'll get into the reasons why there's access to health care later. But anyway, Mrs. Shriver said to me, I've never thought about their health. I thought that their health care was at least as good or better than neurotypical people. And I basically said, I don't know what rock you're living under, but it's not true. And the problem was she was a very difficult woman to deal with. She was, you know, she was headstrong and thought what she was going to think and kind of bullied everybody into thinking with her. So Robert Cook, Dr. Cook, agreed with me and supported me in this thinking. So Mrs. Shriver looked at me and said, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, what do you mean, what am I going to do about it? You know, I teach, I have a private practice, I have a family that needs a lot of my attention. And she looked at me and said, I want you to help me bring health to people with intellectual disabilities all over the world. And I, I said, well, <clears throat> you know, that's a big job. <laughs> So I said to her, somebody had told me if you wanted anything from Eunice Kennedy Shriver, 
that attach it to Special Olympics because that was her passion. So I said to her, can I use Special Olympics as the soapbox, as the bully pulpit for this cause? And for the first time in the history of the Special Olympic movement, she allowed me, someone, to go off mission because the mission of Special Olympics is sports, fitness, and self-esteem for people with intellectual disabilities. For the first time, she was letting someone go into health care. And this was a traumatic change for the whole Special Olympic movement. And so I created a program called the Healthy Athletes Program. I went back to my dean at Boston University and said, we have an opportunity to work with Special Olympics. Can we do it? He gave me the resources of the university. And on a weekend in June in 1964, 1984, we had a, an event where we did a dental screening on all the Special Olympic athletes participating in a sporting event. We screened 750 athletes, but more important, we accessed them into the healthcare system. For those that didn't have a provider that was willing to treat them, we accessed them and gave them a provider that would take care of them. The feedback to Mrs. Shriver was amazing. So she said, let's spread it. So the next year I went to a dozen cities and had a similar event, all university-based, because my thinking was, if I'm going to change the attitudes of healthcare providers, it's not going to be the 40 and 50 year olds in the community, it's going to be the students. So I created a student program where faculty and students would both screen these athletes. And then we went to vision, and then we went to hearing. And now currently, the Healthy Athletes of Special Olympics is the largest public health program in the world for people with intellectual disabilities. We reach 170 countries. We are, we are engaging. We have a budget this year of over $10.5 million. We have uh, uh, these healthy athletes all over the world. But now the important history comes in, Hacky. We had this program, and we were gaining traction. And we were the only people out there that were calling for improved health care for people with intellectual disabilities. So what did we need to do? The first thing we needed to do was to document it. So we went to Yale University, which had, we thought, the best public health program in the world. And we hired U Yale University to do the first ever report, the health status of people with mental retardation, which was the term we used in those years. So the Yale report, the famous Yale report, came out. And it should have been volumes. The Yale report was only this big. And it basically showed us that we know nothing about the health care for people with intellectual disabilities. We took that document, and only the Kennedy Shrivers could have done this. We took that document and went to the United States Senate. And in 2001, at the Special Olympics World Winter Games in Anchorage, Alaska, we actually had the first ever Senate hearing on health disparities for people with intellectual disabilities. I had to pinch myself that I was there. It was a full Senate hearing chaired by Senator Ted Stevens of the House Ways and Means Committee. And everybody in Washington who was a who's who in intellectual disability had to be there, from maternal and child health care to the commissioner in the United States of people with intellectual disabilities. But the most important person who was there was Surgeon General David Satcher, who was indicted by uh, Senator Stevens for allowing these health disparities to exist. You know, at this time, and still today, it hasn't changed, the average lifespan of a white American with Down syndrome is 55. The average lifespan of a um, African American with Down syndrome is 26. That's a horrible health disparity. So forget racial disparities. It's the disparity of people with intellectual disabilities. So at this historic, historic Senate hearing, Surgeon General Satcher agreed to have the first ever Surgeon General's Conference on Health Disparities for People with Intellectual Disabilities. It was held in Washington, D.C., six months after our uh, uh, Special Olympic event. And it was over 300 people that were there. 
Um, and it was, it was the who's who in healthcare in the United States. And at the, I was sitting next to Mrs. Shriver, and I can't describe the feeling I got when Surgeon General Satcher said, we would not be here today having this historic conference if it wasn't for the work of Special Olympics and Eunice Kennedy Shriver. And he presented Mrs. Shriver with the highest medal that the Surgeon General could give. But after that, so after that conference, I started to get calls from physicians all over the country. I'm a neurologist in New Jersey in a huge group. I'm an expert in seizure disorders. I want to work with you. I'm an, I'm an anesthesiologist in Arkansas, and I'm an expert in craniofacial deformities. I want to work with you. I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Florida. I want to work with you. I'm an expert in treating kids with intellectual disabilities. And so in Chattanooga, Tennessee, at a meeting of the Southern Association of Institutional Dentists, this guy named Rick Rader invited us over to his house, and a dozen of us decided that we need an organization of healthcare providers who are the world's experts on treating people with intellectual disabilities. And that was the birth of the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. And we're so honored now to have you as a spokesperson for us and as a part of our team. So how did I fit? So then I, decided, I, I saw the need that Special Olympics, yes, we had seven disciplines and seven great disciplines, but we didn't have geneticists. We didn't have mitochondrial experts. We didn't have medical ethics people. We didn't have, you know, medicine is 80% specialty, right? So we needed all these different people. So my job now is going out of the box to meet people like you who have so much to give and offer and bring you in on our team to build the best health program that we can build and improve the quality of overall health for people with intellectual disabilities. Steve, it's been such a pleasure, and I have a lot more to ask you, and so we're going to end this part now, and then I'm going to bring you back, and we're going to do it again, and I've got a lot, many more questions, so we've got to break this up. You're one of, the, uh, one of the rare ones here, so thank you very much for being with us on Exploring Different Brains. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.com.